If you want to improve your presentation skills or just be better at storytelling in general, this video is for you. We've got Christopher Chin, who is a recovering data scientist who now devotes his entire time and energy to helping data professionals be better at presentations and storytelling. He's gonna walk you through some of the pitfalls to avoid, why data pros tend to not be so great at this, and he's also gonna walk you through how you can capture the attention of your audience, get them to listen, get them to understand your message, and take action. He is phenomenal, one of my favorite people in data. You're gonna love this session. Check it out and let me know what you think in the comments. So happy to have you here, Christopher. Would love to just kind of start off with you giving a little bit of background in your own words would be fantastic. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, John. I'd say that since I was a kid, I knew that I wanted to tell stories. I originally wanted to do fiction, grow up to be a writer. Eventually, I wanted to be a composer, do Hollywood film scoring. But eventually, after a lot of time and financial instability and trying to make things work, I stumbled on data as a profession, and I realized I could bring my love for storytelling here too. I realized companies sit on so much data, but what they struggle with is understanding what's important about it. What can we take action on? And as you mentioned, John, what I do now, working with different companies and also coaching and my community, is teach these communication storytelling skills to data professionals specifically so they can advance their career. And I couldn't be happier doing it. It's awesome. I'd love to hear quickly from the audience, scale of one to 10, where do you guys think you are in terms of presentation skills right now? So 10 is like, you're the best person in the world. One is you're terrified of it. You hate it. It's a chore. Uh, love to just hear. So we've, we've got a lot of people dropping in kind of middle fours, fives, six, sevens, you know, so that's good. Honestly, I think that's probably a pretty good group, right? I think a lot of people uh, probably be, be even lower than that. So um yeah, fantastic. I'd love to, maybe we can start the conversation off. Um, what is it about kind of presentation and communication skills that has you just so dialed into this that you've kind of abandoned the rest of your career and gone really all in, for lack of a better word on this, because um, you've really made it your passion and, and your full focus? I'm so passionate about communication because for most of my life, it was my biggest weakness. As a kid, naturally, I'm very shy, very introverted person. Prefer to be by myself, not in large groups. I gave a TEDx talk two months ago and it was the most stimulating experience probably of my whole life because I was on stage with all these people, the recording's gonna be everywhere. And that affected my career, that introversion and that quietness because I saw colleagues, students around me succeed much more than I could because they were able to communicate well. I remember I was working in one company and I was working 60, 80 hours a week doing data analysis, data science. And I thought my merit should lead to a promotion of some kind. I thought, I think I, think I deserve this to some extent. And then I see other colleagues who are not grinding away with that same mindset, get those promotions. And I think, what is wrong with me? And I, I realized it really is the communication skills. For a long time, I was, I was really angry about that for a while, that I feel stuck because of how I am. But I realized I need to respect the fact that this is how our human psychology is wired to think, that we are wired for story and we're wired to listen to people who can communicate well and articulate their thoughts. We gravitate towards that kind of leadership. And I said, what if I could master that skill? What if I could be formidable at it and use that to advance my career? And now that I worked on it, and now that I teach it and see that growth in people who work on it and master it themselves, that to me is the greatest reward. So awesome. Uh, so, so, so awesome. I mean, I think to, to talk with you and to see you present, I would never guess that this was something that was such a, a challenge for you before. You know, so I, I think the, the biggest takeaway I would have, and hopefully people in the audience have, is like, regardless of where you're starting from, this is a, it's a solvable problem. It's a skill you can burn, uh, you can build, which, um, you know, I think I was the same way, especially early in my career, like very nervous about presenting. Definitely still am too. It's, it's not my natural forte at all but but with with time and with some uh some practice it can um like really pick up and 
and one thing that's interesting, I heard somebody mention, I was talking about uh, what you do and, and they were saying like, oh, so it's like a Toastmasters for data people. Is that kind of, do you, is that an offensive uh, way to categorize what you do? Is it a, a compliment? Like, what do you think? Is it accurate? I think it's quite accurate. And Toastmasters is this fantastic organization. I think it's everywhere around the world. And people join to work on public speaking. What I wanted to do as part of my community was create something specifically for data professionals. Because the skills you learn in Toastmasters are fantastic, but not all of them are applicable to our everyday jobs. We don't need to be international speakers. We don't need to have that theatricality that comes into play in some of the things they teach. We need to present data in a way that makes people trust it. So how can you do that? And that's what I devote my weekly community sessions to, teaching public speaking, which is a really scary life skill in a fun way. That's awesome. Um, I I already put a link to the the TEDx talk, awesome. and I'm going to put a link to the um, the community waitlist too. Um, yeah, I think it's it's at a waitlist currently, right? Still, yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So, um, and I think Becky's adding some of these links to the notes doc. So, th thank you so much for doing that, Becky. Thank you. Um, yeah, amazing. So. Okay, you struggled with this initially. I I definitely struggled with it too. I think it's fairly common for data people to not have this be one of their highest ranking skills, at least until they really start working on it. Why do you think it's it's such a hard one for us? I feel a lot of us as more technically minded professionals feel that sales is against our constitution fundamental. <laughs> I talk to so many data people who say sales, no, no, not at all. Icky, subjective, manipulative. It's just against our core value, which is analyzing data, presenting it objectively and letting it speak for itself. I think that's really the key there. And I felt the same way. I said, well, these people who can communicate so well, these great speakers, that that's unfair, an unfair advantage. but. As we talked about before, it's really how our minds are wired. We're wired for story, we're wired for attention, especially in this noisy, noisy world. And I think that the way that we can overcome that aversion to sales is to see the benefit of it used in an ethical way. Yep. So if you have a really good data analysis and you want to convince people to take action, we need to recognize that emotions play a huge part. Something I talk about in my TEDx talk, is there are two sides to the human psychology. There's an intuitive mode that's on all the time, and it's really emotion-based pattern recognition instant. So you're sleeping at night, you hear a sound, you instantly react. Survival. A, yeah. Exactly, survival. And we're yeah. wired that way because it's important for us to live. Yep. Then there's the slower analytical mode that is ap applicable for data, where we're logically looking at everything and piecing it together. If we just use the analytical mode, which most data presentations do, we miss that huge emotional intuitive chunk that governs our decision making. Imagine if you could use both storytelling and the data, and you could persuade people then to take action in an ethical way for things you believe in that benefit the company. That's the best combination for me. That's, oh, it's awesome. Uh, man, there's so many good things to unpack there, but I love the just tapping into human psychology and the way that our, our brain works at its most foundational level. And do you want to use that most powerful thing or do you not? Like is sort of the question. And I, I think you're, you're advocating for it. And, and also I think your take on us as data people feeling like objectivity is so important and, and being salesy is, is tough. And, and I think also, you know, I think there's, there's not a lot of people that would be really good analysts and really good salespeople and, and like had to decide which way to go. Like I did, um, I did an internship one summer for a, a major bank as a sales intern and man, I was so bad at it. And it was like the most miserable job I've ever had. I was like, the, the thing that I got out of that was I'm definitely not a salesperson. I never want to do that. And then the next summer I was trying to work on analytics and I loved it, you know? So, mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of people are, are potentially, uh, like that, like almost sort of mutually exclusive. And there's probably some people in the middle of it, but, but more often than not, you pick a camp. So, um, really, really good stuff there. Another thing you talk a lot about is the difference between just presenting data and telling stories. Like where does, where do you sort of draw that line and what's the distinction? Like what makes something, a 
where, where a data story is being told and, and any tips around mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. If you think about a keyboard, for instance, or a piano, all the notes on there, if you imagine in this analogy that every note is a data point, so a note on the keyboard is like 50% and another note is 6% increase and another is six times the revenue. If we just share data to non-technical stakeholders, it feels to them like a bunch of random noise all at once. It's not coherent because we're just hitting all the keys and sharing all this data, it's overwhelming. If we want people to understand and to listen to it like music, we need to connect those data points together into melodies, let's say in this analogy. So you could imagine 50%, let's say 50% sales decreased last quarter. Okay, what's the next logical step? Well, that was caused by some sales rep who had a 10% increase in failure rate. Okay, then what's the next step? You could see each data point leads to the next, like each note in a melody leads to the next. Yep. In addition to that, we can add harmony. So you can imagine that 50% number I said, 50% sale decreased last quarter. What if I harmonize that by putting it in context? And I said, that is bad because on average, our sales decreased, let's say 10, 15%. So this is a huge spike. Or that failure rate for the sales rep, 10% is abnormal because usually his failure rates around one to 2%. And you see with that context too, with that harmony, now we're creating this whole musical piece and that becomes something people want to listen to instead of just a lot of random data points we're throwing out because we're trying to prove we did all this work and prove that this is the action we want people to take. Yeah, and, and like you said, you know, we're we're naturally wired to perceive stories and and think that mm -hmm. way versus we're not really naturally naturally wired to like look at numbers and and that type of thing. It's it's a little bit more of a jump. So yeah, I I love love you thinking about that. Um, you mentioned kind of tapping into the uh, the the always on psychology of the human brain the piece it, how about um can you give any kind of concrete examples to really capture the audience's attention like uh whether it's around that specifically or just in in general how do you capture an audience's attention like if you're you're coming into uh, a presentation an exercise i just did with my community earlier this morning was exactly this I showed them a slide deck, a really bad one. And I said, how can we make this more emotionally intuitive? So triggering that always on part of the brain. Because the original slide had tons of text on the page, all these data points to my analogy before all these random noises that people can't make sense of. And the title was overview. If you look at that slide, you have no idea why you should pay attention to it. You tune out, you start looking at your phone. That's how a lot of data presentations are. And I said, let's do an exercise where we create a good title for this slide. Let's make it so that if someone reads that, their emotional intuitive part of the brain triggers instantly and they say, oh, that's the so what. So instead of overview, maybe we can say, ride share performance is doing great this quarter. Or we could say, taxi performance has decreased significantly last quarter. Now, when you say what's going on and a value statement, like this is good or bad, that triggers people to think, oh, okay, maybe I should take a closer look. So yep. it's the combination of data and the emotion that completes the attention. Yeah, I, I love that. I feel like that's something I, I need to do better in my um, presentations with data. And um, it's definitely given me some things to think about and to work on. How about, let's see. So if somebody is like, extremely nervous about presentations. They they are somebody who maybe said they're like a two or a three out of 10. Um, what advice might you give to them to feel maybe more confident, less nervous, less panicky, um, and just be better in, in general? Let me tell you a, a story, which is during my TEDx talk, I was the first person of the 12 speakers to go on that day. And this was the inaugural TEDx event in my part of the city, which meant I was going to have to set the scene for the entire day and essentially all the subsequent TEDx events in coming years. Some there was a lot of pressure on me to do a somewhat decent job. So 
So five seconds before I go on stage, I am freaking out. I am so nervous. I, my heart is beating really fast. I'm breathing really shallowly. And then I remember I have all these techniques that I teach my clients. Let me apply them to myself. And those would be starting with the breathing. Just take really deep breaths. You have to calm your physical system so that you can start working on the mental parts too. So just really deep breaths, slowing it down, going to a quiet place. And then I start working on the mental part, which is really hamming up. Oh, I'm, I have to be perfect. I have to give this stellar job to, to make everybody impressed. But no, the better mindset to go in with is I don't need to be perfect. I just need to give the audience a good time, make them comfortable. Everybody wants me to succeed in this audience. They're not here to watch me fail. So I need to remind myself of that. I need to visualize my success. I can visualize, okay, I'm going to walk up the stage. I'm going to do a fantastic job. Everybody's going to applaud instead of thinking the opposite. So I'm gearing myself up for success and also reminding myself that if I do make mistakes, which I will just keep going, don't draw attention to it. Nobody's going to know yep. with all those things that I did, I calmed myself sufficiently to walk up that stage and give the talk. And so what I recommend to anyone who's feeling nervous about presentation is your nerves are always going to be there. They always are there for me, but there are techniques you can use like these to manage them. Yeah, that's awesome. And I love, um, there's a piece that I feel like you don't hear a lot, but that, that there's a nugget in there. You said, um, my job isn't to be perfect. It's to make the audience have a good time and, you know, to give them some value. And I'm going back to a couple of times I've, um, I've been the minister at a wedding and that's, I'd say probably like the time I was most nervous about speaking because I will not get a do over. If I mess this up, it's the most important moment of my friends' lives. And, um, and I just remember being like so terrified. And then somebody gave me really good advice. They said, you know, you get kind of similar, like you don't need to be perfect. The audience isn't even going to remember a single word you said, but they'll remember how you made them feel. Yeah. And so like if if I mess a word up in my speech, literally no one will ever know. So the goal is to be warm and inviting and uh, make everybody feel good and give them a good time. And if you do that, like that's a huge success. Um, and that that really helped me. I was still 10 out of 10 nervous both times uh that that part didn't help but um <laughs> but it, i think it, i i did okay so yeah yeah i love that yeah it's it's awesome um what do you think are some of the things that people get wrong most often like most common pitfalls about uh, delivering a presentation i think one of them is that we need to say everything that we know yeah because we do so much work to put our analyses together. We think everybody will love to see the same thing, but we need to remember that we have this curse of knowledge. We're such experts in our field that we think everything is cool, but we have to put ourselves in our audience's shoes and remember they care about very different things. So what helps is saying, okay, this audience, what do they care about? What are they trying to get from this presentation? They don't really probably want to know how I got all these values and the algorithms and all that. They want to know, why does it matter? What do they need to do? And if we focus on what the audience needs, making them have a good time, making them feel comfortable, that's how we give a good presentation. Yeah, that's awesome. It's funny because a couple of sessions earlier today, we had Madison shot and she was talking about working with stakeholders. Yeah. And one of, she basically had that same advice that you know, as as data people, we're like really proud of our technical skills of this project that we've done, uh, you know, back end data stuff, the analysis, the insights. And, you know, especially I would fall into this trap trying to show all of it, the methodology, the caveats and the business leader is like, guys, stop, stop. What do you I don't care about any of this. Like, tell me, tell me what to do so I make more money or I make my customers happier, you know, mm -hmm. and um and it's just so funny. It can at first you're like, oh man, I want to I want to flex these technical muscles and mm -hmm. I want to show off all this skill that I have. Um, and it's weird when they, you know, basically are like, I don't care about that. Uh, but but that's that's just kind of part of the the business. And some people will care about it, right? Like your technical manager will care. Other analysts exactly. will think that's really cool. But like the the chief business stakeholders just want to know what they should do about it. And like you say, the story 
um, that that helps them get to to a better business, basically. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I love that one. And it's probably super common for a lot of people, especially in the early stages of a career, um, getting that one wrong. It definitely was for me. Um, awesome. I'd, I'd love to jump into a little bit of uh, this audience Q&A. We've, yeah, um, we've got some good questions going in here. Hey there, hope you're enjoying the video. Sorry to interrupt. We'll get you right back to it. Right now, Maven Analytics is offering a deal that was just too big not to share it with you. We've got an early Black Friday sale, and you can save up to 50% off of Maven Analytics paid plans. So if you've been considering learning Excel, SQL, Power BI, Python, Tableau, and everything else that you need to become a data analyst or accelerate your career, now is the perfect time. Check it out at mavenanalytics.io. You can see the Black Friday offer in the banner at the top of the screen. You can't miss it. Again, if you're on the fence, there's never been a better time. We don't do a lot of these sales, so I hope that some people will take advantage. Now, enjoy the video. I'll let you get back to it. Thanks. This is an interesting one. So this is from Grace. Uh, how can analysts balance the amount of time and effort needed to do the technical work before a presentation with pulling out insights and stories for presentation? So how would you, how would you think about that? Like, when is your analysis done and when are you moving on to the story? Mm -hmm. One piece of advice would be if you don't have the story yet, and there not always is a story to tell, then delay the meeting, delay the presentation until you do. I know that's not always possible, but you yeah. don't want to go into a meeting and have really not much to say. When yeah. you do approach creating the presentation, I recommend not starting with the data and the slides to create. I recommend you start with what is the story I want to tell? And that begins with what is my audience need? So it starts with, okay, I'm gonna to speak to this audience. What is their big goal? What is the big challenge they have? How can I address that with my analysis? And then you say, okay, how can I tell a story to guide them to that action? And then you create the data and slides to support. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that's the right answer, right? If, if you don't have the story, you're not, uh, you're not ready to tell it. Um, yeah, I think that's really good advice here. Here's one that's, this is going to be interesting. So as data people, we're, um, you know, we're a lot of times not super confrontational people, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so how do you handle questions or challenges during a presentation, especially if the audience might not agree with some of your conclusions? Like, how do you, how do you approach that? First, the wrong way would be to get confrontational with that to be yep. disagreeable and say, no, that's not right. Look at all the things I did and this is all justified. The approach to persuasion and to stakeholder management would be to ask questions. So if yeah. somebody is saying, how did you get that? I don't believe that value. I saw something else over there. You can say, tell me more, get more information from them. And maybe if they start explaining it themselves, they'll catch themselves making a mistake if you're actually right. Or if they're still really stubborn about it, you can ask all these questions and then reach a point where you, at the end of understanding where they're coming from, explain yourself. If you still are butting heads, let's take it to another meeting. I can meet with you privately and not hold everybody else up. So essentially the theme is ask more questions and try to understand it from their point of view because there might be a nugget of truth in there. Yeah, that's that's awesome. And that's another one that came up today too, was like kind of letting empathy be your leading edge mm -hmm. versus confrontation and and butting heads like don't react to aggression with more aggression but try to react to it with some empathy is i think really really good advice um this is another one that's that's really interesting i'm i'm curious to hear your take so this is from chenille um how do you deal with uncertainty of whether people are paying attention or not during a presentation or a video call so like you're not getting a ton of feedback like say in this session right here mm -hmm. there's a couple hundred people here are they listening to us is it just you and me in the room? Like, I don't know. How do you do that? Like when you're in a business session? This got so hard during the pandemic when we all go virtual and most people don't have their cameras on. So you have no idea how people are receiving it. I'd say even in person, sometimes you can't tell because people might have these poker faces. You don't know if they're, it's resonating. Yep. The way to know is to ask questions. So you could ask the audience, how is everything being received? You can say, do you have any questions for me intermittently throughout your presentation? And that way you're always getting that pulse check. If people are really confused, 
five minutes in, then you can change directions and make it more clear. So instead of the Q&A really, really, really late, what I usually recommend is taking the temperature throughout. In the middle, yeah. Yeah, and that's it's, in these live sessions. It's really helpful that we have a chat because people mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. weigh in, and I can you know I can see that that folks are still engaged all along the way, which is which is awesome. Exactly. Um, curious on this one. So this is from Grace, and Grace asks, "How do you like to rehearse before giving a presentation?" So like, take you just gave this TEDx talk that was like the biggest presentation you've ever given. How what was your rehearsal process like for that? The best rehearsal process is to record yourself. I did yeah. that every single day leading up to the big day. I did beginning to end. I did just the end, just the beginning, section one to section two, piecing it all apart so that if I'm on that stage and things go wrong, I can pick up where I left off because I know it so well. And by recording yourself, you also see what everybody is going to see on the day. I didn't know that my body language was horrible. I was going really fast. I had a horrible posture until I recorded myself. So I recommend highly, highly, highly. It's really painful to do. I know people hate it, but yeah. it's the best technique for knowing if you're going to do a good job. I love that. And um, somebody gave me that advice when I was going to start doing the, the Mavens of Data show, which by the way, guys, Christopher was on that show. Um, you can check out his, uh, uh, his show. It was, it was a really good one. Um, and the other piece, I think it's amazing advice. The other piece that's very related, somebody told me, um, turn the, the sound off and just watch like yeah. your body language mm -hmm. and then do the opposite. Close your eyes and just listen to it and really focus on those two things separately. And like, I've got a, a million miles to go, but I do think doing that really helped me out a lot too. So such, um, such awesome advice to just record it. Why not? We're in this age when it's so easy yeah. to do that. Just, just do it, you know? Um, Absolutely. That's awesome. Uh, let's see. So uh, we already, that's yeah, pretty similar to previous question. Uh, ah, this is a good one. So this one's from Mohammed. How can data analysts effectively tailor their presentation to different audiences, um, such as technical teams or non-technical stakeholders? Yeah. I'd recommend really understanding what the audience needs as the first thing you do for any presentation. For technical teams, we might be more familiar with what they want because we, we are technical. But for non-technical audiences, we need to do a little bit more work. What is their big goal? What is their big challenge? And a tip I like to give is we have such phenomenal technology like ChatGPT these days. You mm. can have ChatGPT say, hey, what would an audience of this role, of this seniority want from a presentation if you can't ask them directly, which is the best thing to do? So if you're at a crossroads and you're really confused, AI can help simulate the audiences you present to. You can ask it to give you the questions they most likely will ask and then create a presentation that fits their needs. Yeah, I, I love it. That's it's such a such good advice. Um, and yeah, it's it's fantastic. And it makes me think of another uh, that, that question for some reason, making me think of another topic I've heard you talk about before, which is the difference in giving a talk over uh, a webinar format like this versus mm. in person. Can you talk a little bit about the the differences there and kind of like tips for, for each of those scenarios? Yeah. I couldn't imagine giving my TEDx talk virtually like, like this because I have this little box to work with that really limits how much you can see in terms of my body language. I just have my hands and my facial expressions to a degree. But on an in-person stage, you can see me walk around. You can see me gesture, you can see me point to things, you can feel my presence in the room. And that's the real human part. I think that's missing here virtually. To compensate for that, we really need to focus on the use of voice in virtual webinars, because that is the instrument that people are going to pay attention to most. So really, as you recommended before, just closing your eyes, listening to your voice on recording and saying, how can I make that more interesting for people? That is a really good technique for virtual presentation. Yeah, that's that's awesome. I love that. Um, it it also makes me think of uh, I have a friend that does stand up, and they said during the pandemic, there no but there were no clubs doing stand up for a while, right? And so, but there you could do these things online, basically over Zoom. And they said it was like the worst experience in the world because you 
you a big part of it is you can't read the audience and you can't feel their energy and what they're giving mm -hmm. back so you don't know to speed it up you don't know to lean into certain things and it's just such an interesting dynamic like how much there there is actually like a give and take you think it's just the speaker pushing out but but it's it's really about everybody who's there mm -hmm. um so yeah it's it's really interesting um let's see what what other questions we have in here this is an interesting one have you have you ever trained your voice to sound well for the audience? Is it important um, in getting your audience uh, involved in catching ideas? Like, is this just your natural voice or is your, have you sort of changed how your voice sounds to, to be a better speaker? Yeah, I, I actually have a video coming out at some point soon where I show, I did not always speak this way. I used to have a voice that was a lot more quiet. People said I had a quiet voice and people said that it sounded unconfident. Hmm. I listened to myself and I said, they're right. I real it's because I had this mindset back then that I need to kind of do what other people say. I need to hide behind the screen. I, I can't stand out too much. I don't believe in my own expertise. And that reflects in how you speak. Now that I've done this for a really long time and I really believe in what I say, that changes how I articulate my thoughts. So I show in that video that will come out on my YouTube channel at some point that now my voice is completely different because my mindset has completely changed. That's that's awesome. That's, that's so interesting. Um, I, I love it. And one of the things just as I'm having this conversation with you, I noticed that you do so well is you use the pause really effectively. You know, so you'll a lot of times people who are nervous, it's like, just run, 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 like get the words out. You got to fill the space. And I hear you, you know, deliver a point, even if it's a brief pause and I, it feels really powerful. Um, is, is that a conscious part of your uh, strategy? And like, how can folks take advantage of that? It is. And what I recommend is before you give a response, you should have a general sense of where you're going. What I, when I work with clients, that are very nervous, they do jump in. So after you ask a question, they jump in straight and they talk, 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 because they're afraid of that silence. They're afraid that they seem inadequate because of it. But in that pause, you can think of where you're gonna go. You can think of the structure you're gonna use. So when you asked that question to me, I said, okay, what am I gonna say? I had the big point. Then I said, okay, this is how I'm gonna structure it. In that instant, if I need more time, then I have a longer pause. So pausing is really essential to gather your thoughts and give a good answer. That's awesome. Um, yeah, that's, I, I think that's really awesome. Uh, similar question to one of the ones we had before. This is from Lyndon. So how do you keep everybody engaged when there's a lot of variety in the audience? So you, we talked about if you're delivering like to C level versus some other data people, the, the levels of like technical detail would be different. What about if all of those people are in the room? What do you do in that situation? Those are some of the trickiest audiences to present to. My top tip would be if you have some administrative control or some influence on the person who organized it, separate the meetings. Because if you speak to everyone, you're really not speaking to anyone. If you are speaking to a room where people have 10 different goals, you're not going to get much done. So if you can speak to the organizer, separate it into a meeting for the CEO, then a meeting for the technical folks. So you can focus on what's applicable for each. But if you do have to have this mixed audience, then address the highest level decision makers needs first, make sure that's addressed. And then later on, you can get to those technical portions if people are still interested. Awesome, awesome, yeah. Um, I think that's that's really smart. Like, yeah, because because that way you're you're addressing what's interesting to everybody. And then you can say, hey, for, you know, for all the data geeks like me out here that are interested in the methodology, like I'll stick around and, and I can do that at the end. Or, or like you could see this appendix or mm -hmm. um, whatever you do. I do that with um, when, I, when I deliver just like a, a document presentation that I might not even be talking to. I'll have like the key points and then I'll say, hey, here's an appendix for, for anybody the, the people like me that actually care about the methodology and, and the data nuances, there's more data, you know, like Jason, you don't have to read this because I know you don't care about that. And that's that's been a, an effective way. It's kind of like the online offline version of, of kind of the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very cool. Um, let's see if we've got a few more questions in here. Uh, 
yes, a lot of recurring themes here about, you know, if you're introverted, uh, this one's interesting. So, um, you mentioned kind of not having a lot of experience at the beginning. If you were to start over today and you wanted to get better at practicing your skills, is there any good way that you would put yourself out there to just start getting more experience? I got a similar question from one of my clients who's more on the introverted side like myself, and they were really hitting a ceiling in their career because they were technically brilliant, but they were really scared about speaking during meetings, just terrified, absolutely. And they wanted to come to me to work on that confidence. And I said, if I were to start all over again, work on my communication, I would do it gradually. So for you, for this person I was speaking to, my client, I said, next meeting you have, I want you to speak once, just one thing. And you can even prepare what you'd like to say. You know the meeting agenda, you know what's gonna be discussed, have one brilliant thing that you want people to remember you by. Next meeting, practice that again. So each meeting say at least one thing. Then when you're comfortable, let's increase that to two things, maybe even three things down the line. Maybe the next time you can give a presentation and volunteer for it. So you're slowly expanding your comfort zone to the point, maybe I can give a talk in a conference one day. So it's really developing that courage over time through that 1% consistency and growth. That's awesome. Yeah. And it, that seems like it makes it much less stressful and intimidating, like to, to say to somebody who's never given a presentation, hey, do that this week, maybe too scary, potentially. Mm -hmm. But like, yeah, can you make that one thoughtful comment that people will remember? That doesn't seem crazy. You know, like you can make one comment. Um, that's I, I really like that. I think that's that's a really smart and measured approach to it. Um, here's, I mean, the questions in this are so good. Like there's so many questions that I wouldn't think to, to ask, but, um, but they're really awesome. This one's from Chenille. So let's say somebody interrupts you and you get rattled and you like lose your train of thought in the middle of a live presentation. What the heck do you do in that situation? Yeah. I'd ask the audience for help and never forget you can do that. The audience is not some mass that you're speaking to. They are people that want yeah. to see you succeed. So if you're lost and you completely can't gather the thought yourself, say, hey, what, what was I just talking about? <laughs> Make it funny, you know, play it off humorously. They'll help you out. Nobody's not going to say anything. And then you can resume where you left off. I love it. I, I didn't anticipate the question and I didn't anticipate your answer, but I absolutely love it. It's totally, totally the right thing to do. Um, and that's fantastic. Let's see. Uh, do, you, do you have any... Um, speaking exercises to sort of fortify your articulation and enunciation before uh, presenting, maybe for anybody who feels like they might struggle with speech a little bit. Um, any tips for that? I work with a lot of non-native English speaking clients, and this yeah. comes up a lot. They're worried about their accent. And I tell them your, your accent is not the problem. The problem is that articulation and enunciation at times, because if you're not understood, then people can't take the action you're recommending. So what I recommend as a fun exercise is, is gonna be totally left field. Read fairy tale stories out loud or some fiction out loud and really enunciate every single word. Pretend you're reading to a kid. Really make it lively and engaging. And if you sound out every word, you can feel every little consonant and vowel, you can translate that experience to giving data presentations at work. It really is a powerful exercise. I've seen it work for the clients I work with. So good. Oh my gosh. That's such a great, you know, such a great answer. And again, not something that I would think about. Um, how about this? Uh, earlier in your career, did you ask for feedback after your presentations on how to improve? Um, and, and also, or is there any other way you, that you would do self-reflection? And do you do that today? Like, are you looking for feedback usually when you give something like your TEDx? Is, is there any, mm -hmm. do you have a spotter out there that's like saying that you trust and is willing to kind of break you down and help you get better? Yeah. Something that I think becomes difficult the more senior you get is you get less candid feedback because people are afraid to get on your bad side. But I believe that we're all on a continuous learning journey. No matter how senior you are, no matter how much of an expert you are, there's still more to learn. And for me, I always want feedback on my presentation. So if there's feedback from this session, 
I'd love to hear it too. I gave a class just a few weeks ago and I said, I'd like to see what the survey said about how I did. How can I keep improving? Early in my career, I didn't seek that out because I didn't want to hear it. I was like, ah, no, I don't want to seem like I don't know what I'm doing. I don't want to hear people's criticisms, but that's really the only way to grow. Yeah, I, I think it's, and it's such a good point. Like you need, it needs to be the right person. So mm -hmm. like, I'll, I'll give my examples. Like there's people that are on my team that, you know, I'm their manager. And I, I always ask, I want feedback too when I'm doing something, especially something like, you know, hosting a live event that, that was a new thing for me this year. Um, and I said, hey, is there anything I want to get better? Please be brutally honest. And people on my team just say, hey, you did a great job, <laughs> you know? Um, but I luckily have a couple of, uh, their friends and business partners that are they're more senior and they are happy to tell me uh, the things that I'm not doing a good job with. And they'll do that all day long. Um, and they have a very long list and it's great. And I really do appreciate it because uh, it, it's what helps me. So you got to find that right partner that's mm -hmm. uh, that is willing to do it. Um, amazing. Well, I think we're, we're just about at time. Um, folks give christopher some love in uh in the chat here this this was fantastic as expected um and let me i just want to one more time drop those links here so that yeah, uh, so that everybody can see um all this good stuff that we talked about uh, so that that's down here in in the chat um chris any last words of advice for the audience like if if they could focus on one thing uh to get better at their presentations what would you point them at I'd say that presentation, public speaking, storytelling are learnable, just like all the technical skills you know. And all you need to do is just like you learned SQL or Python or R, is devote a little time every day learning something new, learning how to apply all these techniques you want to do. Recording yourself is a great way to accomplish that. And if you approach it in that regimented way, the same way you learn your technical stuff, you can become a really confident storyteller. It all comes down to practice at the end of the day. Amazing. I mean, it's the perfect way to end it. Thank you so much, Christopher. Hey there, I hope you enjoyed this video. This was part of our open campus event where we ran 24 sessions in front of a live audience over the course of two weeks. It was a ton of fun. We did all these live sessions and we opened up our entire learning platform for free. You did not need a paid account to take advantage of all the courses. So folks could learn Excel, SQL, Power BI, Tableau, Python, et cetera, all the stuff that you need to learn data analysis skills and take your career to the next level. If you missed it this year, keep an eye out. We'll definitely be doing this again next year, probably again in October. We would love to see you there. And the last thing that I'll leave you with, if you're looking to take your skills to the next level right now and you've been on the fence about a Maven Analytics paid plan, we are currently running our early Black Friday sale. This is the absolute best time to pay for Maven Analytics if you want to. So don't miss out. You'll have the opportunity to save up to 50% on paid plans, which is a pretty great opportunity. You can check out all the details at mavenanalytics.io. Just look for the early Black Friday banner at the top of the site. You can't miss it. Hope that we'll see some of you there as well. Thanks for watching.